Hello, class. <laughs> it is another day, and it is another uh, <clears throat> set of lectures. I, of course, am using my entire vacation <laughs> to make lectures so that you guys can actually learn something uh, over the course of this semester. And, um, you know, I'm very serious about my teaching and about facilitating, you know, your learning and trying to get as much learning for you over the course of the semester um, as I can compared to a in-person course. And of course, an in-person course, uh, we're, we're realizing the benefit uh, and the advantage of that all the time. I have been a canary in a coal mine that has been you know, yelling for years that online courses do not have the quality of in-person courses. And so I'm trying to do that with, uh, you know, the, the added homework, the uh, lectures so that you can refer back to the lectures, not just a one-time thing, uh, you know, making things flexible, uh, doing whatever I can to maximize the learning uh, of this material that you guys uh, can get. And I found with, uh, like I said before, with electromagnetic field theory, I taught over the summer that about 95% of what I would have taught in class was really covered. Uh, I, from what I've heard of other professors and from other students and, uh, you know, recent alumni, uh, that has not been the case uh, in a lot of other courses. And uh, in fact, faculty, you know, tell me that. And um Proctoring is, is just proctoring tests and stuff just does not exist anymore. So uh, the fabric of in-person learning, you know, is, uh, is much different. But, but we can adapt. And that's why I'm saying that, you know, with this, with the lectures, with the archived lectures, with the homework, with the, um, you know, laboratories, we're, 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 we're going to adapt. And as soon as the vaccine's out, we'll all be back in there, except for the anti-vaxxers, which, oh my goodness, uh, you know, that is just going to be such a, a bloodbath. But uh, again, don't want to get into um, political stuff, because uh, you can only go bad there, right, as <laughs> professor? <laughs> He's too liberal. He's too conservative. I, and I, I get that both ways. So. Um, I don't uh, don't want to really express my views here, but what I do want to do is to start to look at um, some of these uh, examples. Now we're getting into uh, banking and turning, and and I think that's where I wanted to start today. Let's see, we've got that curve, and that's out of the way. Uh, I did want to do just a, a couple, a quick interesting um, uh, analysis, of, uh, analyses, I guess, of um, a thing I've always wanted to, you know, uh, let's go to Enceladus, all right? So we're going to go to Enceladus, and you're probably thinking, isn't that the uh, watery moon of Saturn that has plumes that go up, uh, you know, uh, a thousand kilometers uh, filled with organic material that is just spewing out of it. And unlike Europa, it's not in a dangerous radiation zone where everything would be killed in that ocean, but Enceladus is far enough out that uh, we can easily get organic material. We've, we've actually discovered organic material in the ice plumes that are blasting out of Enceladus. Uh, so um, that's going to be a great water world for us in our deep space colonization of the uh, solar system, right? Now, when we look at the G of Enceladus, the, uh, we know that it is about um, one-fifth the uh, gravitational attraction of the Earth. We can easily figure out what, what that's going to be. What we want to do is we want to put it in an orbit, right, that is one kilometer 
above the surface. Now we know that the radius of Enceladus, I'll use capital E, uh, I'll use capital EN, how about that, and then EA for Earth. But the radius of Enceladus is a thousand kilometers, right? And we want this to go one kilometer over the top. So whether it's a thousand or a thousand one for the radius, it's it's not going to really matter uh, that much. And we know that uh, for this satellite that we're going to run through the plumes, right? The water plumes. We're going to have equal and opposite forces. We're going to have mg up here, and we're going to have m. Oops, wait, mg down here. And we're going to have uh, mv squared, that's our tangential velocity, over r up there, right? And so the, the m's, of course, are going to cancel out. We don't care about the weight of the satellite because those are going to cancel out. Now we know that the orbital velocity, right, is going to be equal to the square root of g of Enceladus times the radius that we have to go and uh, the square root of that let's just go with 9.81 meters per second squared divided by 5 isn't that the gravitational attraction of Enceladus and then uh, the radius that we're going to be going is 1001 uh, kilometers, so 1,001 times 10 to the 3 meters. Let's get everything back into our primary units or combination of primary units. And so that tells us that the, uh, if we take the square root of all of that, that's going to give us 1,400 meters per second. And I think everybody knows now that the uh, exchange, you know, between um, meters per second and miles per hour. And that's why I'm working in, because, you know, we still do use um, miles. I mean, you know, when I'm driving to New York or Michigan or whatever, I'm, I'm using miles. So we're more familiar with miles than we are. Um, and we're more familiar with miles per hour than we are in meters per second. And of course, the exchange is just 3,600 over 1,609, 3,600 divided by 1,609. And again, we come up with the 2.23, don't we? So times 1,400, and that gives us uh, equal to 3,132 miles per hour, right? So either one of those two would be acceptable, whether we're working in meters per second, or whether we're working on miles per hour, that's uh, uh, a relatively you know slow velocity. So how do we slow something down that's going uh, you know twenty thousand miles an hour, or <laughs> forty thousand miles an hour? Well, first of all, we get it in orbit around Saturn, and then we slowly change the. Uh, apogee so that by the time we get over to Enceladus we're only going about 3,000 you know 140 miles per hour and then we can just use a small little blast to slow us down and get us into orbit around Enceladus and of course we wouldn't really want to go just one kilometer above there we probably you know those those plumes are uh, like a hundred kilometers high so uh, we could we could go up a little higher we don't actually want the thing to get caught in that plume do we so that was just, uh, 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 I would really say, just a uh, introduction or, or an end maybe to the orbital stuff that we're doing. Although I do want to look at a, a couple other things that are much more interesting. Um, you know, we looked at the geosynchronous uh, satellite. And uh, just before I get into uh, turning and banking, I would, uh, you know what? I think I'm going to get into turning and banking first. The, the example problem that I'm going to do for you later on is about a rocket. And it's about a real rocket. I mean, you know, it's pretty much the Saturn V rocket. And we're going to analyze that and see how... Uh, 
how long it takes to get up to speed and everything else. And so we'll analyze that, but we're gonna do that a little later. The first thing that I, I wanna do before I get into that is I wanna talk about uh, turn, turning and banking. Now, what I mean in this is, is, is if you can think about it, think about a, a race car, right? Now, a race car is going around a race circuit, the Indianapolis 500, and we bank those tracks, don't we? And so if all of a sudden I had a, a, a race car, and let's just put some wheels on that race car, right? Zoom, 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 zoom. I've got a little windshield there. And that race car is racing around that track, right? And it's inclined. So it's going to have a couple different forces on it. First of all, it's going to have the weight force, right? Working down, we know that that's mass times the gravitational attraction. But also, isn't it as it's zooming around this course, right? This circular course, let's say that I've got a a racetrack that is uh, like this, right? And I'm going around the course of that racetrack, and of course I've got to have the racetrack banked. And so that banking, because I'm going around it all the time, I, I, I'm going to have, uh, you know, we're going around it with a velocity, a tangential velocity. And so we know that we're gonna be pushed out. I'm gonna call this F sub I. So we're being pushed out in that direction. And being pushed out in that direction, the force is mv squared over r, isn't it? That's an r. And then we know this is mass times gravitational attraction. So when I'm looking at that, I think everybody can see if I were to drop a normal to the surface that I have there, this theta, not only it, it, it uh, um, refers to that, right? Not only refers to that angle, but doesn't it also refer to this angle? Remember when we did that before and we were looking at inclined planes and slipping and slipping down an inclined plane? And we, we rotated the plane up and we had a pendulum that was hanging from that and then we broke that down into its two component forms. One that's perpendicular and then one that is tangential to the surface, right? So we still have those two, those angles, uh, whether I wanna, I'll call that theta. So, so those are both theta. So if I want to find out what that theta is, what is the, the angle that I have to bank that roadway, then that's just going to be the inverse tangent Right, and do you see that? Why I say that? Because we've really got an angle here now that is uh, the weight force, and then F sub i. Right, and so this is going to be our angle. I hope I got that right. Yeah, so F sub I could have done it other ways, and well, that you know that's our angle or whatever. But um, actually, I should have probably put F sub I up here, and then had uh, that right it comes out the same way. But uh, then that would be my my angle uh, down here. Right. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We, we still see what the angle is. We know what the angle is. And so when we look at the opposite side, it's going to be F sub I. And when we look at the uh, adjacent side, it's going to be W. Right. So the banking angle, let's just simplify that a little bit, is going to be the inverse tangent. And now we have F sub I. That's going to be MV squared over R, and we have W, which is gonna be MG, right? So the M's are gonna cancel out, and what I get is I get the inverse tangent of V squared over R 
G. Does everyone see how that works? All right, well, let's do uh, an example problem uh, for uh, just, just a, you know, highway or whatever. And I happen to have one right here. A car goes around a curve on the road with a velocity of 60 miles per hour. So let me just use our equations here. Let's put that into the equation box. And let's talk about our, our, uh, our example problem. So we know that it's 60 miles per hour. We also know 60 miles per hour, I'll let you do the exchange or the uh, conversion on this, is 88 feet per second. How does that work out, right? 60 miles per hour to 88 feet per second. You're gonna have these, you know, you gotta do these your entire life. So 60 miles per hour, right? Let's get rid of the miles first. So I've got uh, five, oh, excuse me, five, two, eight, oh, feet in one mile, right? And then we wanna multiply it again. We wanna get rid of hours. So I've got one hour and 3,600 seconds. All right, does everyone see why it's a little bit larger? 5,280 divided by 3,600, that's where that differential comes in. So we've got 88 feet per second. You know, 88 feet per second, uh, you know, we can always change that into meters per second too, couldn't we? I'm gonna leave it at feet per second because uh, I'm going to do this uh, problem in, in the British Gravitational system. So uh, let's just look at our equation that we have up here, you know, our, our inverse tangent of v squared over rg. We know what v squared is, it's 88 feet per second. Uh, we don't know what r is. In fact, that's what we want to find out. We want to find out what the radius of curvature uh, is for, for this road. In fact, this road that I'm going around is really just a freeway, right? You know, uh, on freeways, um, the, the, the banking is at 10 degrees, right? There are some places where it's actually higher than that, but those are abnormal. We usually limit the banking on a freeway due to construction requirements to about 10 degrees, okay? So if, if that is at 10 degrees, then what does my radius of curvature have to be as a highway designer to uh, make sure that this car that's going around that, that's going on that curve on that freeway, right? Because let's face it, a race car is not going 60 miles an hour. I'm really talking about a car on a freeway. So uh, what would be the radius of curvature that I would have to make uh, that freeway. Now, let's say that we've got a freeway and we're going around a corner, maybe uh, down where 95 hitches into 93 or something like that. We're going around that big corner there. We're going at 60 miles an hour. It's pushing us out inside the car. We're like against the wall. No, we aren't. Not at 60 miles an hour, are we? So, you know, I forgot to turn on. Uh, oh, no. No, I did. Okay. So, um, so let's get back to this. I've got a, a 10 degree freeway. What do I have to make that radius of curvature on the highway? And you, you know, when I say this, when we figure this out, you're gonna say, yeah, that, that seems about right. That seems like that would be a radius, the radius of curvature uh, that we would have uh, uh, on the freeway. So let's solve this. Let's solve this for, for R. So I know that the tangent of theta right, and we know what theta is. Theta is going to be 10 degrees. We know that the tangent of theta has to be v squared over rg, right? So can't I multiply uh, r, actually, why don't, here, I'll write it out this way, v squared over rg. And I hate to do too many steps and then lose somebody and you know, just because I assume that uh, you guys really have seen all this before. <laughs> of course you haven't. So R is going to be V squared divided by R tangent theta, right? Does everybody see the algebra that I did there? Now that would be 88 feet per second 
I'm going to square that. I'm going to divide it now by, wait, that would be G times tangent theta. Thank you. <laughs> so G then is going to be 9.81 meters per second squared uh, times the tangent of 10 degrees. Okay. So let's plug that into our uh, equation. Uh, 88 squared divided by 9.81 divided by uh, the tangent of 10 degrees. I hope I'm in degrees. I don't know. Yes, unfortunately, I was in radians. 88 <laughs> feet per second squared divided by 9.81 divided by the tangent of 10 degrees, not 10 radians. And what we end up getting, well, that doesn't seem right. Let's see. What, yeah, I got, uh, yeah, that's squared, 88, 10 degrees. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And of course, this is, what, uh, you know, I'm sort of glad that this came up because uh, uh, this is a problem. If you remember the Mars orbiter that went around, uh, you know, Mars, um, was destroyed. $500 million Mars orbiter uh, and all of the research we could have gotten off of that was destroyed because um, we were using uh, pounds and the Europeans were using Newtons. And as a matter of fact, what it did was it ended all direct collaboration on a single mission with Europeans from that point on. We, we do not do it. In fact, with the Curiosity rover that's over there now, uh, the containers that's gonna have all the dirt in, that's gonna be a separate European Space Agency uh, mission, right? They're gonna go over and pick up those canisters and return them to Earth. So, so we're working in concert with the European Space Agency, but we're no longer doing symbiotic missions, you know, where we're, we're all working together because they don't use the same units we do. Isn't that horrible? So, and I've still got meters there. Better, better cross that out too. I guess that would be true if I would be, if, if I was in feet per meters per whatever, but we're not. We're working in feet per second. So, this is going to be 32.17. I know, even I was caught. <laughs> so don't let that happen to you. And of course, that's feet per second squared. So let's do this again. So 88 uh, feet per second, the whole quantity squared, divided by 32.17 feet per second squared, divided by the tangent of 10 degrees, gives me, that's the answer I was looking for, 1365.8. Two. And of course, the point two probably is calculator error anyway. And that's going to be in feet, isn't it? Because everything in here is in feet. So our radius is going to be in feet. If I wanted to find out uh, what that was in meters, it would be equal to 416 meters. Now, how did I get that? I got that by one meter equals 3.28 feet right? Same way I got that. 9.81 times 3.28 gives me 32.17, right? And so that's how we got it. And, and, and the radius of curvature now, you know, relatively low, 416 meters. Uh, let's say that. I'll, I'll work in meters. We understand meters a lot more now because they, they seem to be like uh, feet. <laughs> All right, um, or yards, I should say, uh, 416 meters. So we can think in terms of football fields. So it's about four football fields would be the radius of curvature uh, of that highway that we're designing. All right, now let's, uh, let's end that um, example. And I want to, uh, now, now that's turning and banking. I, I wanted to do one, uh, it also, by the way, you know, I'm drawing a car here, but what I, I'm not drawing is uh, a, a plane, right? Let's say that this is, the, is an airplane. 
I'm just going to draw it from, boy, that's a horrible airplane, isn't it? I'm just going to draw it from the back. So let's say that that's an airplane. You know, I'm a pilot. I think all of you know that I'm a pilot, probably. And uh, I love to, to, to fly. My, my son is an airline pilot. And um, yeah, I have an airline pilot, uh, a dentist, and a lawyer. Every family needs a lawyer. That's what my father kept telling me when I was upset that my daughter was becoming a lawyer. <laughs> my dad was, every family needs a lawyer, Scott. And boy, has she saved our life, our family, you know, in so many ways. April uh, and, and, you know, being a lawyer. Uh, of course, you know, uh, my, my family uh, is basically background is medical. Doctors, half doctors my brothers and sisters, and then uh, uh, half physical science. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I was way too emotional to ever be going in to, you know, tell family members that their, you know, parents are dead or, or whatever. So I could, I, you know, I just couldn't do that. But I love robots. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't even know a robot yet. Uh, so, the same thing happens on the banking of airplanes. When you're going around a corner, same thing is happening. Weight down, force off. And that, so that's why I'm talking about turning and banking, right? Turning and banking. So for an airplane, we're banking for, you know, a car and a racetrack or a freeway. We're going around a corner, but it works exactly the same way. The same um, uh, free body diagram, the same analysis. Now, I want to, uh, to look again. I'm going to take a 3,000-pound car, and I'm going to tell you right in the beginning, this, uh, uh, this doesn't matter. Right? If I say I've got a 3,000-pound car, and I want to point out to you, I'm not using uh, a, a, a mass here, am I? Because pounds are not mass. Pounds are weight. If I wanted to uh, find out what the mass was of a 3,000-pound car, I would have to divide it by the gravitational constant, wouldn't I? That's right. So let's do that. So the mass of a 3,000 pound car is going to be 3,000 pounds divided by 32.17 feet per second squared, right? So, what is my mass? My mass is really 93.17. And what is the unit of mass in the British gravitational system? We've done this enough times now that it shouldn't be new to anybody. It's 93.17 slugs, right? A slug, the slug is the unit of mass in the um, British gravitational system. All right, now, I'm not looking at this. This is a great little uh, uh, drawing I made here of a plane because I love planes so much and I love to fly. But, um, you know, I want to say another thing just, uh, it, it, just uh, for a second. Um, if, because, you know, I was very interested in flying and I, and, and I know other students that have uh, both learned to fly prior to me uh, mentioning it to them and students that have started taking flying lessons when they, have gotten uh, out of school and they've got a job and um, they think, well, you know, God, I always wanted to fly. I would recommend Beverly Flight Center. Now, I, have my, I have my plane up at Beverly Flight Center uh, and I fly out of Beverly. But uh, my son learned out of Beverly Flight Center. Several students uh, that I know, uh, it, before I mention it to them, that my, my son learned to fly out of Beverly Flight Center. Um, in fact, the reason that I bought my plane, my plane, by the way, is a Piper Warrior 2. Piper Warrior 2. And it's full IFR, instrument flight rated. And um, I bought it because my son was learning at Beverly Flight Center and a share, a half share of a, well, actually, I think it was a one third share of the Piper Warrior. My Piper Warrior uh, was for sale. And so I bought it and my son then, you know, used our plane 
I've, and the plane was rented out to the Beverly Flight Center too and stuff, used our, uh, our plane to do his uh, pilot training and, and went all the way through. You know, his, uh, the first license you get is your VFR pilot's license. Then you get your IFR pilot's license. Then you get your instructor's license. Then you get your commercial license. Then you start flying for an airline uh, and you don't make a lot of money off it for the first couple of years. But then as you get your hours up to 1500 to become a, an airline pilot, um, you know, from that point on, you're really an airline pilot and, uh, and it's a good job. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very good, well, you know, uh, it doesn't, it, it's hard to start out, but uh, once you become a pilot, it, it works out a lot better. All right. We're not talking about pilots. We're talking about a car that's on a flat uh, road and that car right? Uh, 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 it, it's a future car. So I'll, I'll draw it, uh, you know, what? there you go. There's our windshield, whatever. It's a future car. And so it's going around a corner, right? And so it's going to have a force that's pushing out here. And it's also going to have a weight force that's pushing down here. But what else does it have? It has a frictional force, right? A frictional force that's trying to stop it from sliding. Right now, that's what I want to look at is, is this car going to slide? If I'm going around the corner here at 60 miles per hour, again, we're going 60 miles per hour and we immediately can change that to 88 feet per second if we're working in the British gravitational uh, system. And, um, uh, so we know that we're going around a corner and we know we, we want to look at our free body diagram. Now we know that this is the weight, right? There's no um, banking on this corner at all. It's going around the corner at 60 miles an hour. I've got a force that's pushing out. Um, now I did want to do, 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 do. What is the, yeah. So I'm going around the same thing up here, my radius of curvature. And I want to point out to you, uh, you know, do we have to really bank this thing 10 degrees? And in fact, uh, it certainly helps. But even if we didn't quite have 10 degrees, we're still, even in snow, probably are not going to be sliding off the road. That's what I want to point out to you. So we have 1365 feet is our radius of curvature. We're keeping everything in the same units, right? The same unitary system as we make our, our way through here. We know that our weight force is just going to be equal to mg. And we've already calculated that because, in fact, it was given to us. The weight is going to be 3,000 pounds. Doesn't that also equal N because we have N pushing up in the opposite direction, don't we? That's right. So our frictional force is going to be mu sub S times N. And I haven't given you mu sub S yet. You're probably thinking, oh, he just changes it all while he's doing it. No, I don't actually. So I'm going to say that mu sub S is point two five and and in fact that is mu sub s usually on a a, a road that uh, hasn't been plowed and it's starting to get about half of an inch of snow on the road now usually tires to the road are, are anywhere from 0.6 to 0.8 is the static but once i have snow on there and it's not plowed and this is what i want you to realize even when you're driving this is what I realized. That's why I don't get in. I don't drive off the road. Uh, mu sub s goes, goes from like 0.7 all the way down to 0.25. Uh, if that snow is landing on, on the road and it's starting to get a little deeper, right? About an inch deep. It's actually, if, you, if it's like two inches deep, it's, it's better to drive on than if it's like half an inch deep. Because the, the weight of your tires then liquefies it underneath and if I if I had a lot of snow under there it would be a lot harder to do that all right and you probably notice that when you're driving behind a car and there's just a little bit of road a little bit of snow on the road you probably notice that that car because of its weight or that truck especially 
is liquefying. The pressure that it's putting on that snow is liquefying the snow and turning it uh, into that. So we're almost done. So let's do that then. So 3,000 pounds is the weight of the vehicle. 0.25 is my static coefficient. So we know that the frictional force is going to be 750 pounds. Now, what we, what we want to know is, is F sub i going to be greater than that? As I go around this corner too fast, right? I'm going around the corner too fast. Is F sub i going to become so great that it gets to be greater than 750 pounds and I just drive off the road? Now, we haven't looked at it with the 10 degree, you know, incline. This is if the road is flat and if we never, you know, inclined it uh, at all. Let's look at that. So I've got M times v squared over r, right? We know all of those. We've got 93.17 slugs. I know you're thinking, God, I only want to work in the SI system, but you know, that's not, that's not learning. Because when you get out there, you're going to be working in both systems. A lot of older engineers that you, you meet will still be working in the British gravitational system. Um, and so you have to know how to work in both of the two uh, systems. Now, I shouldn't have put in that, that equal sign there because really what I want to do is I want to put in 88 feet per second, and then that's going to be squared, isn't it? And then we know that it's 1365 feet. Everything's in feet, slugs, everything's in the British gravitational uh, unit, so we, we don't have to, to worry, and in fact, uh, when we multiply this out, and I already have it multiplied out, but I'm going to do it again, 93.17 slugs times uh, 88 feet per second squared divided by 1365 gives me 529 um, pounds. Okay, so we're being we're pushing out with 529 pounds, but that frictional force can go as high as 750 pounds. So uh, what I wanted to show you is even on a freeway, if I'm going 60 miles an hour uh, around there, I'm still going to not slide off the freeway. But I, I know what you're thinking. Well, well, when will we get? What speed would we be going? Uh, to actually slide off the freeway, if that was 750 pounds, what would this be? Well, 750 pounds, right, times 1365 divided by 93.17 um, equals, taken to the square root, is 104. So uh, here's what I'll do. So, so uh, V to slide. What's the velocity that we're going to need to slide? And that's going to be the square root. Just follow me through this. I know you can do the algebra with no problem. Right? So that's going to be 750 pounds. That's right there. Uh, times 1365. Feet divided by 93.17 slugs, all taken to the square root, and that gives me 105 feet per second. Now you're saying 105 feet per second. What is that uh, in... Um, what is that in miles per hour? Well, you know, if we come up here, we could sort of use that, couldn't we? 88 and 60. Can't we just use that 88 and 60? So if I was to do 60 over 88 times 105, 60 divided by 88 times 105, that gives me 71.6. 71.6. Miles per hour. Have you ever seen anyone go faster than 71.6 miles per hour on the freeway? That's never happened because uh, the speed limit's 70 miles per hour 
right? So, so no one would ever go 71.6 miles per hour <laughs> because they'd be going too slow because everyone's driving by at 91.6 miles an hour. I wanted to show you that. I wanted to show you this because even the 10 degrees, and you're probably saying he's probably going to give us a 10 degree one like this uh, to see if it's sliding if I'm driving 85 miles an hour uh, on the freeway. That's what you think I'm going to give you for a test problem. And you're right. That is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you something just like that. And you're going to be so happy that you uh, saw this lecture. Now, we've been going a little bit long for this first lecture, uh, but I covered what I wanted to. So let's move on to the next lecture. See you there.